Well, good morning and welcome uh, here on Tuesday in London to what I think is going to be an absolutely fascinating webinar with our guest today, Jeremy Silver, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Digital Catapult. Now, the title today, I hopefully intrigued many of you, Augmenting the Augmenters, How the Great Western Metaverse Will Be Built. And for those of you not aware, the metaverse is meant to be a persistent 3D environment interacting with the real world at all times. And this realizes a, a dream an old friend of mine, uh, Neil Stevenson, had when he wrote his books back in 1992, uh, in particular Snow Crash, looking very much at would there be a persistent reality in virtual reality uh, for all of us? And that's what we're here to explore today. Now, you'll know me. I'm Michael Mainelli. I'm one of the directors of Zien. And it really is a privilege to be able to introduce many of these webinars. And I can only do so thanks to the generosity, tolerancy, if you will, of our various sponsors who allow us to range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. And today may feel a little bit technological. It may feel a little bit almost, may I say, uh, gamey. But uh, Jeremy has a very, very deep message here about what the future holds, perhaps for all companies in the world, as we try and engage with what seems to be emerging, this new metaverse. Now, my job is to get out of the way as quickly as possible so you can hear from our expert. Uh, Jeremy's going to be speaking for about 20 minutes, and if I may, three quick points of housekeeping. Uh, the slides uh, will be posted on the website uh, after, after this. Yes, there is a recording, which will go up in approximately two days, so expect it up sort of late Thursday. Uh, and most importantly, uh, please do uh, suggest questions, uh, comments, observations on what is a fascinating subject, but put them into the chat facility here on GoToWebinar because I'm here with you and I won't be receiving emails or texts or what have you. I'll feed those into a conversation uh, with Jeremy, which will last about 20 minutes. Uh, Jeremy will be getting all of the questions and comments with your email attached. So if you want to get in touch with them or anything, just again, stick it into that uh, chat facility and he will receive all of them. So if I may, uh, Jeremy, with uh, no more uh, ado, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michael, and uh, and good morning, everyone. And uh, it's a real pleasure to, uh, uh, to be able to talk to you today and to uh, share a few thoughts, as Michael says, about the future of what we are now referring to as the metaverse. And uh, uh, I'm the uh, the Chief Executive Officer of Digital Catapult. Uh, Digital Catapult is uh, a, a, a government-funded agency uh, devoted uh, to accelerating uh, from the innovation base and the academic uh, research base and uh, accelerating commercialization. And in the, uh, there is a network of catapults. There are nine of us all together, all funded by Innovate UK, uh, and each in uh, uh, focused on individual sectors. And in our case, uh, really looking at, at digital opportunities, um, we really focus on early adoption. So we see the opportunities uh, both for early stage, high growth companies, but also for traditional businesses uh, to gain competitive advantage to grow, uh, to produce new products and services uh, through the early adoption of advanced digital technologies. And, and that's what our mission is all about. And uh, as part of that, uh, we have really spent a lot of time trying to debunk hype uh, and trying to work out what's real and what's just promotional stuff. Uh, and at the same time, helping companies as they drive that early adoption, getting over the chasm. And this famous graphic that you'll see here uh, it shows one chasm, but as you all will be aware, there are multiple chasms as people progress from uh, early stage to scale. Uh, and so uh, in the process of doing that, uh, we have been uh, really interested in a number of emerging technologies which are now becoming uh, more and more mainstream. So other, other areas like 5G, for example, uh, artificial intelligence, obviously an enormous field. Uh, distributed ledger technology, which is where Michael and I first encountered one another, uh, exploring the outer reaches of that. Uh, and uh, and in particular, in relation to this morning's talk, uh, uh, looking at virtual reality and immersive technologies. And virtual reality and augmented reality are the, the, the keystones of this, but haptics more generally uh, are included in this group. Uh, and virtual reality has been around for a long time, as, as you probably know. Um, but um, in recent years, uh, the, the hype has also uh, been accompanied by some, <clears throat> some reality uh, and some real effectiveness. And as the power of computing and the speed of processing has increased, 
the opportunity uh, to really exploit the potential of the technology, which has often seemed to outstrip the actual practical application of the technology, uh, is finally becoming uh, more real. So these kinds of numbers are starting to feel like they may represent uh, a meaningful opportunity. And uh, increasingly, we're seeing industry uh, interested in virtual reality in particular uh, in relation to training, as well as in the sort of core area of entertainment and gaming out of which it's really come. And, uh, and so uh, uh, we've pursued that from a UK perspective as part of Digital Catapult's work. And what's been interesting there is to recognize that, of course, the development of this space is really dependent upon two factors. One is uh, the platforms, the headsets, the wearables, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the screen displays uh, that enable people to experience these kinds of things, whether that's in augmented reality or virtual reality. And of course, the content that goes with it. And there is a kind of virtual circle there, a, uh, and at times a difficult circle to break out of, where uh, there needs to be enough content to drive the sale of headsets, and there needs to be enough headsets to warrant investment in good content. And that kind of circle is a challenging one to break out of. And for that reason, uh, when, the, when we've looked at this from a UK perspective, we've, we've really said, well, look, the strength in the UK particularly is on content creation, on formats, on storytelling, uh, and that's where we should put the focus. Uh, and if we can drive that, then we can drive opportunity for UK businesses in the process and help perhaps break out of that kind of Gordian knot. Um, the challenge though, of course, uh, is, is how to do that. And with some public funding has gone into this um, and from UKRI, we've seen some quite large investments, particularly in this program called Audiences of the Future, uh, which produced some very substantial demonstrators uh, with really decent budgets behind them, aimed at trying to really provoke uh, uh, an understanding and, and, a, and a step change uh, in the capability of companies to develop this kind of product. Uh, we at Digital Catapult uh, have also partnered with uh, the Arts Council of the UK of, of England and uh, although at not the same level of budget, I think actually the numbers of companies we've reached has probably been greater uh, in a program that's really sponsored the uh, prototyping of storytelling in this space. And um, we've also run an accelerator program uh, called Augmentor you see what we did there, mentorship for augmented reality companies and, uh, and help to investment in early stage businesses along the way. Um, but it has been a checkered journey and uh, a really interesting one. So if you, uh, if you look at the current, uh, this sort of makeup of the landscape, and this is for a, a couple of years back now, but you can see the kind of structure of it, the focus that you can see there, both on the, the infrastructural enablement, the kind of base layer of infrastructure needed to enable this kind of thing, the tools and platforms that need to sit on it, and then the broader applications and content areas. And, uh, and it's interesting when you look at this, of course, it, uh, the, in the light of the pandemic, one of the ways in which companies pre-pandemic were hoping that they would drive adoption of virtual reality was through location-based experiences. So shopping mall experiences where uh, consumers and shoppers could go and have a half hour, 20 minute experience. Um, of a Star Wars type, uh, for example. Um, and that would ultimately, they hoped, encourage people to then buy headsets in the home as the price is gradually reduced. But the, the pandemic put a complete freeze on all of that, as you can imagine. Uh, and so there has been uh, less acceleration in this space than perhaps there might have been. But it's been interesting. And if we compare it uh, with the AR sector, uh, you can see that there is a similar structure there as well. And obviously the, the, the fundamental difference between VR and AR is VR is, exists in an enclosed space. You, you have to put a pair of uh, headset on uh, and then inhabit an entirely self-contained fictional world in which other humans may appear and you may be able to interact with them, but you're entirely enclosed uh, as opposed to AR. Uh, which is a projection onto the physical world, our real world. So instead of losing touch with our real world, we instead see a layer uh, imposed upon it and interesting characters popping up and emerging all over the place. And of course, the, the most prominent example of that uh, succeeding on a global scale in the last uh, few years um, was Nyantek's experiment with a project called Pokemon Go which many of you may remember was a virtual uh, an augmented reality version of Pokemon in which uh, strange fictional Pokemon characters appeared in people's front gardens, in uh, historic monuments, in uh, forests and city centers, and uh, bunches of kids were found running around in all sorts of uh, slightly at times dangerous places 
uh, as well as slightly wrong places, uh, trying to find these Pokemon characters. And it, it was really, uh, I mean, it was a huge hit. Not, not yet been followed, but a massive hit. So these two markets have gone up and down. In, in 2017, there was an enormous level of interest and a huge amount of investment optimism uh, over the 2017 to 2018, 2019, that investment interest lapsed and, and went down. We've actually in the last year uh, through the pandemic seen an increasing interest in the space. Um, but of course, uh, uh, there is a question here, and I think you know this is the first poll opportunity. I'm encouraged to, to make this session interactive to ask you just to thinking about that. Do you think that based on this kind of understanding of the market and the UK's position in the market, should we be encouraging public money uh, to, to spend to stimulate the, uh, uh, the production skills and the, and the a content strategy uh, at all, a little, push hard on it, go for it big time? Uh, love to know what your thoughts are on that. And I guess this poll will tell us quite quickly what you think. That's uh, right. I've just lost What's going to happen? Is it, is it, you give yeah. people a chance to think about that. Okay. Over half the audience have voted. Just giving just a couple more seconds, Jeremy, for the laggards to come in. Excellent. Okay, great. Yeah, we're well over three quarters have voted. I'm now just going to close that poll and share the results with everybody. So... Uh, Push hard seems to be Ooh, look at that. half the audience. What a uh, what a what a brilliant result! Well, I'm I'm I feel buoyed up and and uh, full of optimism based on that poll result. Thank you for that, Michael. Thank you, folks, for for your thoughts on that. Um, perhaps um, uh, slightly slightly ironically, um, from there I'm going to tell you about a, a huge disaster that happened in this space, just to show you uh, uh, how difficult things can be and what a roller coaster ride it's been. So magically, many of you will be familiar with the company, but they raised an extraordinary amount of money. Uh, uh, they they beat both Apple and Facebook to the market with an AR kit, an SDK, a software development kit that would allow people to to uh, experiment. Uh, they raised 2.3 billion, including from, from folk like Google, uh, and they overpromised enormously. The, a fascinating company, completely eccentric, wonderful in many respects, and yet in the end, deeply flawed. And uh, in really the, 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 the expectations that have been raised around their, their headsets and the wearables simply were not re really uh, brought to reality when, when, the, when the product came out. And even before the pandemic, the company was on the slide, and when the pandemic hit, it just absolutely uh, was catastrophic for their valuation. And they're now, instead of being focused on being a, a massive, what they used to talk about, the Magiverse was their version of things. We were going to launch ourselves into the Magiverse. They are now focused on very narrow niche uh, of medical devices, which may well uh, ultimately prove to be a good uh, source of ROI, although whether or not they'll ever make back the level of investment we shall see. So uh, a roller coaster ride in this space, uh, but nonetheless, uh, there are some really core players in the midst of all of this, uh, hardware and software players who are, are um, I think, integral to the development of it. Epic Games, really well known because of their production of the game called Fortnite, uh, a virtual world that kids have really uh, adopted massively that all of you, if you've got teenage children, will be fully aware of. Uh, for better or for worse. Uh, and uh, But in the background, uh, Epic also produced something called the Unreal Game Engine. And uh, also like Unity, who also featured on that slide, uh, manufacturers of game engines have really developed a, a platform solution for game developers to save game developers time, uh, to allow for all the interactivity between lighting effects uh, as characters move around, uh, changes in perspective, uh, and so on, all to take place uh, in software so that people don't have to design that every time. And Game Engine is a real key to this, and we will come back to that. But you can see other players there, uh, HTC Vive uh, from South Korea, uh, Facebook owning Oculus, of course, uh, a really big driver in this space, but Microsoft not to be left behind with the HoloLens, and uh, some really interesting new players like Enreal, a Chinese company who are producing um, uh, uh, augmented reality glasses uh, that look not that different from what I'm wearing right now. So a really interesting selection of companies there. Um, the effect of the pandemic on all of this was not what you would have hoped. You might have thought the pandemic, gosh, we're all in lockdown, we're all home, we're all consuming content like crazy. This would be the perfect moment for all this stuff to take off. But the hardware availability simply wasn't there. The price points were still too high. And in the end, although there was a boost to the sales, it wasn't at the level. Uh, that the companies really have needed. Uh, but I think nonetheless, the acceleration in online adoption uh, and the incredible amount of content being 
consumed on streaming platforms now has boosted overall optimism and we are seeing i think greater confidence uh, from investors in, in this space now uh, oh sorry i've um, i've slid too fast ahead now in another part of the forest let's just take a step back and see something else that's been going on. So, and this is again, a, apologies if this is a bit UK centric, but but uh, it's a really interesting uh, phenomenon. Now, uh, in this period, as the streaming platforms have been developing, quite unrelated to virtual reality or any forward looking thing, uh, we have seen the most enormous uh, boost in, in UK studio space being invested in. And uh, in fact, uh, that, that, that two billion pound forecast is already out of date. Uh, and there are umpteen new major studios being created in the UK. Uh, Pinewood has been booked out entirely by Disney for uh, itself, for the Star Wars and, and Bond going forward over the next 10 years. Shepparton has been booked out for the next 10 years uh, by Netflix. And the appetite for American studios to produce in the UK uh, has really grown immensely. And this level of investment is, is just continuing. And this is partly because of uh, the relaxed labor laws that exist in the UK, which unlike the US, which is still heavily unionized, uh, it is much more flexible here to work working arrangements in the UK, but also, of course, because of the tremendous technical and creative and talent skills that exist here in the UK, which are in, immensely attractive to the studios. And uh, even this weekend, uh, we saw another £700 million studio investment being announced uh, from one of the big uh, Hollywood players. And uh, Sunset Studios from, from LA investing 700 million pounds in a new site in Hertfordshire. So this is really growing. And what's going along with that is all about uh, this incredible level of demand. And that's of course is built uh, with, on the immense confidence in subscription-based platforms, which drive uh, a recurrent need for growing amounts of content. And one of the things that's accompanying that is a need to try and reduce the, the time it takes to make films and also the cost of making those films. And virtual production uh, is becoming a thing. Now, vir what is virtual production? Virtual production is really an evolution uh, of old green screen uh, filmmaking, uh, but it takes advantage of LED screens and it takes advantage of game engine technology. Uh, those game engines that were being used to make video games, it turns out can also be incredibly effective uh, in providing the real-time calibration uh, between an actor moving around on a, on, in front of an art, a screen with a pre-recorded three-dimensional environment uh, displayed upon it. And the lighting changes and calibration, the changes in perspective, all those things that work inside a video game can also be made in filmmaking. And this is creating the most extraordinary level of disruption to the way in which filmmaking can be made and the, and the levels of uh, uh, savings that can be achieved uh, the reduction in carbon emissions that can be achieved because you don't need now to send an entire cast and crew on location. You can send a small crew off to Morocco to film some desert scenes and then bring them back to a studio where you can film people much more locally. And so the uh, potential here is huge. Lots and lots of hesitation amongst traditional directors and producers, as you can imagine. It's technology, it's risky, it's still really new. Uh, it's less than 10% of all media production is using this technology, but it's growing fast. And interestingly, the kinds of players who are contributing to all of this are familiar from that other area of VR and AR. And that's why uh, this has become so interesting. Uh, so here's a question for you in a separate area of this conversation. Do you think this aspect of virtual production, this disruption of media production, is it going to disrupt it at all? Uh, do you think it will do that partially over the next five to 10 years? Or in five to 10 years, do you think that disruption will be complete? Great. Well, I've started that poll as well, Jeremy. Uh, as ever with FS Club, well over half the audience have voted in uh, about 12 seconds. Just going to leave it open for a few seconds longer. It's great. Well over three quarters of the audience. Excellent. Just about to close that poll and I'll share the results with everyone. Partially. So, interesting. Interesting. So the you're an interesting audience. You've got a great appetite for augmented reality and virtual reality, but you're not so sure that film production will be disrupted um, in quite the same way. That's uh, that's that's really uh, fascinating. Thank you very much for that feedback. Um, so, what happens in all of this, and why do we talk about the metaverse? Well, what happens, I suppose, is is the way of thinking about this is when you combine 
social media with game worlds, with AR and VR, what you get is an industry mega trend. And that is the metaverse. And the numbers of people who are now talking about this and the numbers of people for whom this is becoming central to their business planning and their strategies is growing inside the media, technology, gaming and entertainment and media space. So a, a metaverse, uh, Michael kind of described it very briefly before, um, but this is, if you think about how essential the internet has become to us, and this was very much at the heart of, uh, of, of Neil Stevenson's vision in Snow Crash back in the, in the early 90s, when the, when the beginnings of the internet were just a, a glimmer in people's imaginations, and he rolled that whole thing forward and said, well, what happens if we can create an entire three-dimensional environment in which uh, no longer are you seeing computer avatars, but you're seeing lifelike humans, and we can all interact with each other, and we can create whatever spaces we want. Uh, and this is that the, the combination then that we're now starting to really see. Uh, and some of you will remember uh, worlds like Second Life, World of Warcraft, which has taken an interesting stumble in the last couple of months. You may have seen reports recently. Pokemon Go, I just I just mentioned. Uh, but now we've got these huge new arenas, so Fortnite, Roblox which are, uh, on, on the face of it, gaming platforms for kids that have got nothing to do with, with these much grander ideas. And yet, uh, what we can see is that the volume of traffic that they're attracting and the kind of interaction that they're creating uh, is, is extraordinary. And, uh, and what it's producing uh, is, a, is, is a, a real sense of how close that vision of a fully 360, fully virtual, and fully uh, realistic environment could be. And that might be enclosed inside virtual reality, or it might be even more intriguingly uh, imposed as a layer on our world around us with all sorts of interesting opportunities there as well. Uh, and so Niantic, who pioneered with, with Pokemon Go, are absolutely pushing into this space continuously and thinking about new services and possibilities, and they are really intriguing. Um, traditional industry, it actually has its version of this too, and we've, you've, you may well have heard a lot of the talk about digital twins, uh, in which manufacturing processes or engineering design processes are emulated, uh, and companies like Improbable have been really working on that for some time, and that's again, in a sense, a, a parallel movement. Uh, and so uh, there are just some extraordinary indicators of this now, just to share with you a few thoughts. So Travis Scott, who's a, who's a rapper, did a gig in Fortnite and attracted 12 million people, uh, 12 million kids to participate live in that event. And then a, another 12 million or more have seen it on YouTube subsequently. Um, Amazon have introduced their AR hair salon. So you can see your do before you have your hair cut. You, know, you want to know what that blue rinse is going to look like. Um, Google. Uh, Google Maps is probably uh, the least known, but the best application of AR that is currently in the market right now. Uh, if you go onto Google Maps and uh, say you have that experience of popping up out of the subway in New York City and trying to work out which corner and which direction you're facing in, actually an AR solution which provides you with a view of the buildings that you're looking at and aligns you is a really, really brilliant way of doing it. Google are hiring wayfinder designers for AR uh, by, uh, you know, in, in very large numbers at the moment. The US Army last year did a deal with Microsoft, $49 million deal uh, to try out the HoloLens uh, in the defense concept. Microsoft itself is lining itself up. You think about that combination of LinkedIn, of Minecraft, and HoloLens, and again, you can see a similar combination of factors. Zuckerberg, most recently in an interview with, on, on the future of Facebook, described it as a, a metaverse company. And Epic, uh, the makers of Fortnite, but also the makers of the Unreal game engine, uh, just raised an additional billion dollars on top of what they're already making out of Fortnite to really push into this marketplace. And one of the key participants in that round was a traditional media company, Sony. So you can see the way in which strategically the, the alignment is taking place here. And Gartner, interestingly, just came out with a report uh, this week uh, saying that by 2035, 125 billion pound market uh, in digital humans. That's to say 360 degree totally realistic scanned humans that can exist inside uh, interactive spaces and that we can all interact with. So it raises some really interesting questions. You can see the kind of marketplace that's evolving. Uh, again, you know, the experience is everything, but discovery inside this, so understanding, well, what do I find? How do I find anything in my metaverse? 
uh, is important. The creator economy, the sense that individual creators have got a role to play and will contribute massively to the content in these environments. Uh, spatial computing, that sense of, well, how do we navigate? How do we actually make all this work in a 3D environment? How do I find my way around? How do I navigate? How do I know where the narrative is going? Uh, a decentralized system that's cloud-based that allows these people, people to experience the same metaverse wherever they may be geographically. Uh, the, the actual human interface, so how do I actually get into it and what does it feel like? Uh, and of course, what's the enabling infrastructure that sits underneath all of this and, and, and the big uh, kinds of resources that are needed to power it? Uh, so what kind of metaverse future might we be looking forward to? And this is where I think that, that it really becomes interesting because you can see that the kind of business model that Amazon and, and, and Apple have pursued of, of walled gardens fits very well into this kind of world. And it's interesting that you know a Apple has made lots and lots of indications of an interest in AR in particular, but still hasn't launched a killer app in the space. We can see that there are other players. So I've mentioned Niantic, but Facebook too, uh, Fortnite and Roblox, they're more interested in a more open platform where they bring other partners in, where they bring people in to create the content for their, the platform that they enable, uh, multiple players contributing, creating those kinds of dependencies. And there you can see uh, the, the real battle for the business model here as well. So is this going to be an app store type model of a 30% tariff on anyone who wants to take part? Is it more about in-app purchases where I can level up by paying to level up or whether I can, where I can buy fancy digital outfits for my characters to wear? Uh, or is it actually all going to be an ad based model? And you can see that right now in the courts, Epic is battling out with, with, with Apple over the 30% tariff on the App Store, and you can now start to see, well, what's the strategic thinking behind taking out a suit of that kind when you think about where these platforms are headed? And perhaps there might just be a glimmer of hope that instead of either of those models developing, we might actually be able to, between us, uh, invest in and support a more open, more accessible, level playing field kind of metaverse that would rather, as the internet did, lower the barriers to entry for, for, for far more players and create a really interesting opportunity for, for a much more diverse uh, and inclusive set of companies to participate uh, in what will be uh, the next incarnation of media. And I'll leave it there. Jeremy, that's fascinating. We have a huge number of questions, so I'll, uh, I may be a bit quickly, uh, quick on some of this. Um, I think one of the mo more interesting things for me is always, if you look at films these days with a critical eye, you can see the amount of computer generated imagery in just about anything. It's, you know, it's moving into rom-coms and, and you know, it's well beyond just the, the sci-fi or the action films. Um, so we, we are definitely heading there. Ian Shackle is curious, can you give just very quickly kind of the current price range of uh, VR headsets and any other user hardware to kind of get into this metaverse? So, yeah, it's, it's still pretty expensive. I mean, you know, if you want to get a, um, you know, a Quest, Go, which is the the latest kind of um, uh, Oculus uh, wireless headset. It's about five, 400 pounds for the headset, and you've got to have a pretty chunky um, uh, hardware setup, uh, laptop, PC to to drive all that as well. So the the total investment for a you know for a home for a couple of people, you know, it, you're probably getting on between a thousand pounds and and fifteen hundred pounds still. So that's that's the problem. You know, it's still a, too expensive for most people. Um, yeah, and there are a bunch of other challenges too, as well about the, the nature of existing inside and spending much, very much time inside a, a virtual reality headset. We had a session uh, at FS Club about 10 or 12 years ago on Sense, where somebody had brought in. Um, Timothy Coleman is kind of curious, what do you think of Sense for the metaverse? There is a company that is digitizing molecules. Um, and uh, and trying to see whether we cannot actually uh, digitally synthesize smell, and clearly the the combination of of, of haptic experiences uh, where you know you get some physical feedback to what's going on is already enhancing gameplay big time within the entertainment space. Uh, the introduction of of smell is probably the most powerful and most evocative trigger of, of uh, emotion, uh, reminiscence, sentiment. And so uh, there are people working on it right now. 
You know, one of the things uh, I've noticed is a lot of people <laughs> over the last uh, 18 months or whatever coming to grips with what's a green screen? And we, we can see that we're already adding effectively an AR environment in Zoom, Teams, what have you. Uh, Jeremy Wilson is curious, you, you know, you may get to this, but do you see these technologies having an application in enhancing remote meetings and conferences? Well, I think that uh, that, that, that is, again, you know, the, the whole concept of the metaverse is exactly where all this stuff is heading. It, it's, it's another route in to the same destination because you know we're all very aware of how limited this experience is of how two-dimensional it really feels of how little our body language transmits and so on and this notion of a digital human uh, where you are completely scanned in 360 degrees and in which your movement is interpreted and interpolated by ai so that although you you know that what, what's scanned may be a video essentially video footage uh, that is then turned into an interactive entity. So that instead of going into a virtual space as, as we do at the moment and encountering avatars who look pretty clunky and pretty weird and, you know, the best thing we can do with them is make them look fantastical and then we can have fun. But if you try and make them look human, there are all sorts of challenges still. Um, and, and people talk about the uncanny valley, which is the, the challenge of trying to have eye contact with an avatar, which is extremely difficult to do. So we, we've still got some way to go. But if you think about what the gaming and interaction experience is, and then you think about what well, is this business application of Zoom, they are absolutely converging and heading in the same direction, and the same tools will, will enhance them. Uh, ben Koppelman is interested in your comments on two things, if you don't mind. Um, what do you think about the future of music production and new musical experiences? Any, any thoughts on that? And what does the convergence of gaming and traditional music industry, any, any things you've seen out there that give you an inkling of what that might look like as well. Well, I think the, the uh, you know, the music industry has always been at the forefront of uh, playing with new technological capability. And, uh, you know, I mean, my, I started my my life in, in, in building a website back in 1994. And, you know, when we built it, we didn't build it because we thought anyone would come and visit the website because in 1994, there wasn't anyone on the web. We built it because we thought that the news and television media would cover the fact that we built a website and that would promote our artists. And to some extent, you know, that is still a model for the music industry. It still has that ability to, to cut through, uh, to, to shine a bright light on uh, really leading edge stuff and to bring a big audience to it. And to that extent, there's a really interesting symbiosis between uh, what the technology is able to do and what, the, and what the music industry and what artists are able to, to bring together. So I think the uh, there are some really interesting developments going on alongside all of this spatial computing for, all, for the visual in the audio space. And uh, we at Digital Catapult, we recently, uh, just uh, a year or so ago, ran a session which was all about the, the kind of the surround sound space. And I was amazed. There were like 40 or 50 companies that, from the UK that came out of the woodwork to demonstrate the kind of experimentation that they've been doing about being able to place uh, sound very specifically in the environment around you. So I think that is that is coming and that will enhance the whole experience. And we know that, you know, I, mean, I talked about scent, but audio uh, in these environments is incredibly important in terms of setting the scene and creating an environment and creating reality. Um, and uh, well, I mentioned Travis Scott, that, that kind of gig experience inside a virtual world, um, that was very much an avatar based kind of experience with a giant figure and, and individual players um, playing around at that at sort of human level, uh, all kinds of new experiences I think are gonna come from that. And, and again, you know, the, 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 the thing that's really interesting of course is that the creators themselves now, artists, musicians, are no longer simply thinking about their music, they are thinking about the totality of the environment in which they're communicating with an audience. Yeah, yeah I often point out to people that when they talk about, for example, video conferencing, uh, online video conferencing began around 2000, uh, uh, Jitsi was 2003, Skype was 2003, but the killer app area just didn't seem to arrive even there. People were still after physical meetings. You've spoken about the sort of the, the lack of a killer app so far in this space. You've also spoken about the devices. Um, two, two other questions. Though. John Nelson is interested in the energy implications. If AR, VR became more commonplace, does the world infrastructure have the capacity to support it? And I would add to that the comms infrastructure because 
a lot of this stuff doesn't work if I don't have extremely high speed comms. And even then, uh, in things like shared musical experiences and timing, uh, the latency is still too large. It's, in fact, it's difficult to see how we would ever get rid of it. So any, any thoughts on that and the limitations? Yes. Of my well, I think, I think two thoughts. I mean, yes, of course, it's incredibly data intensive. And uh, I mean, we know that, that data centers are responsible for 3% of, of carbon emissions globally. Uh, there is a challenge there. Um, however, I think there is a flip side. So it's, a, it's, it's not a straightforward uh, calculation, this, because the flip side is uh, people do not necessarily, will not need to travel uh, to attend an experience like this or to have an experience like this. They can experience it from home. Uh, the casts and crew don't necessarily need to travel in the same way. Virtual production absolutely reduces the need for, for that kind of thing. Of course, uh, some people who worked in the film industry for years and used to love going on location hate this idea. But the fact is that it will actually uh, prevent people from having to get on so many planes or drive cars uh, across deserts and so on. So it's a, it's an interesting combination. I think, you know, the, the, the analogy might be with distributed ledger technology with, with Bitcoin, where the, the kind of mining uh, energy consumption rates are, are through the roof. Uh, I think we will see that coming down. Uh, and interestingly, um, we've recently at Digital Catapult run a program, uh, we're in the middle of it at the moment, actually, a project called the 5G Virtual Festival, which has been precisely about putting musicians uh, uh, together in a virtual band in multiple locations. So in our case, some in Brighton, playing in the Brighton Dome and others in the Powerhouse Studio in, in Chiswick and having them play together. Uh, over a 5G network and and the engineers were able to tweak the latency to what was an acceptable level uh, to the point where the, the band could play incredibly well together. So much so that when they came out of the session uh, and one of the singers looked around to say, well, where, where was, where's the guy I was singing with? Uh, you know, he felt like he was in the next room. And he was in London. She was in Brighton. So uh, it, very effective. But um, the other thing to say about this incidentally is that the, the development in AI that are starting to be able to create effective algorithms without having to draw on massive data sources is reducing the energy consumption levels uh, of algorithms in that way. So I think that we will see progress, um, but obviously there's a, there's a very complex calculation to make there. Well, Clive Bullen, we all get fatter due to not getting out enough, which is one bit. Um, Michael Cooper, um, just, just picking up quickly, I, mean, I think you gave an example. He was asked, what have you seen in the performing arts segment? Uh, is the UK a leader? What's the most advanced and exciting thing you've seen? And it sounds like this 5G experiment might be it, but if you had something else you wanted to add, uh, please do. And uh, yeah, and we'll stop there. And then I've got a, quite a few more questions. <laughs> well, there, there, um, there have been a, a some really interesting developments. So we, we ran a program called Creative XR, which has, has really encouraged um, storytellers, really, to, to innovate in this space. And I would uh, encourage you to go and have a look at the output from that program, which you can explore on, on our website. The, the, uh, the interesting thing about the 5G festival example, the music example that I was sharing with you earlier was that um, one of the other things that we did in that trial uh, was that we had the drummer so we, we had a we had a drummer in a in a separate room we had a bass player and a singer and a keyboard player on the stage in the brighton uh, dome and then we had a guitarist and another vocalist in the powerhouse in london but the drummer who was on his own was wearing a pair of unreal uh, augmented reality shades he looked like he was wearing super cool shades and it was a super cool drummer, but he was actually wearing augmented reality glasses in which he had a visual feed of each of the other musicians. And, and his feedback on that, of the sense of enhanced collaboration, of the sense of, of in a no latency environment, feeling like musically the collaboration was as intense as if they were in the room together, I think was, was really revealing. So we'll pursue some of this. We'll see where else this goes, but um, it's, it's, it's been an interesting program and, uh, uh, we're about halfway through. We've got another year to go, so we'll we'll see where we get to. Okay, um, I'm going to read a slightly lengthy one from Carolyn Roberts. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, Carolyn ran a research council-funded project explaining different ways of educating national and regional policymakers about flood management. They experimented with Second Life using the Open University Island. It was a bit clunky, but easy to use, and it was popular with the local authority staff and councillors who joined in but a majority of the older people much prefer personal and genuine interactions. What lessons can be learned from this about the relative magnitudes of challenges of uh, technical or human mindset 
you know, because a lot of the population are over 50 and quite resistant to direct use of this type of technology, perhaps your filmmakers too. Any quick thoughts on that? Well, I, I, it is a generational thing. There's no question about it. And, and I think the, uh, the, it's interesting, the pandemic has, has accelerated people's adoption. I think the mindset has changed significantly as we've all suddenly felt that this way of communicating with one another uh, is acceptable, works, and actually we can be very productive this way. But at the same time, obviously, we're incredibly conscious of, of how much lost experience there is in the in the around the edges of all of this and those side conversations and that understanding of, of, of what people are really feeling through their body language and so on uh, is still a long way off. So I think it's generational. I think it's no no coincidence uh, that Fortnite and Roblox are the places where people are seeing the most vivid uh, demonstration of the potential of all of this now. Um, and, uh, you know, there will be some people, uh, and I think in, in some respects, maybe all of us will increasingly feel the need to be more black and white about either being online and fully engaged in an online experience or absolutely offline and unplugged uh, and, and re reverting to, to, to a natural experience and that we will need to adjust our behaviours. You know, we're still incredibly, uh, we're all awful, at, you know, how addicted we are to our phones. Um, and, and that need to become more sophisticated, I think, will grow as actually the experiences become sophisticated, more sophisticated too. Now, you, you titled this talk, How the Great Western Metaverse Will Be Built. Uh, Chris Williams is curious, how do you see the Chinese comment regarding online games being the opium of the mind on AR, VR in the West? Do you agree with the Chinese? That was a very interesting, and uh, obviously the the success of Tencent was the the, the thing that spawned that comment. And uh, I, I, yeah, I specifically called this the Great Western Metaverse for two reasons: partly as a sort of a, a harking back to Isambard Kingdom Brunel and a suggestion that this was a, a revolution of a similar uh, magnitude, uh, but also to make that distinction because yes, what we're doing here in the West is mirrored uh, in in China, particularly. Uh, and uh, but with some very significant differences. So we already can see and are aware of the degree to which China is using a subset of these technologies uh, for people crowd control, for, for social management uh, in ways which dem democratic societies would find unacceptable, I, I hope, uh, I believe. Um, and so uh, th I think that's interesting. And the, yes, that suggestion that somehow or other it's an opium for the people, well, of course, that is actually a classic uh, um, criticism which has been targeted at all media. Uh, television had exactly the same criticism leveled at it when it became mainstream. Uh, and one has to question perhaps what the motivation for suggesting that is uh, and whether or not uh, it's simply a matter of, of whose opium it is uh, and therefore, you know, the degree to which uh, the, the right kind of opium is acceptable and the wrong kind of opium isn't, perhaps, uh, in that environment. But then I think we're perhaps straying into, into, into areas of politics that perhaps I should avoid for now. Okay. Um, time for just two quick more questions. Uh, first, Dan Johnson, you know, in all honesty, how competitive is the UK in developing software and hardware to meet this emerging demand? Well, it's very interesting. You know, that the reason why I pointed out that growth in the studio market and the degree to which studio investment is happening here at an unprecedented level isn't just an indicator that we've got a deunionized workforce and so it's easy to work here. It's because there is a real talent base here. And it's a really interesting combination of talent because, you know, we have got great games development companies and we've had great games emerging out of the UK, even if their commercial exploitation has happened elsewhere. Uh, we have, and, and that's all about storytelling. We've got great theater, which is about storytelling. We have great film and TV production capabilities and we've spawned tremendous visual effects companies. Uh, like frame store and double negative most famously so so we do have uh, a, a real uh, strength in the uk it is more creative i believe than what can necessarily come out of the us we have got a more collaborative way of working here uh, the, our, our corporate culture is more collaborative and less uh, uh, competitive perhaps than it is in the us and so i i really believe there's there's a real opportunity for the uk here uh, and actually uh, there's also a, a kind of a necessity because i think we have to future proof uh, the uk's media workforce 
uh, because of the speed with which this kind of technological change is coming. So I think we, sh we really should put public investment into this. Uh, and it's a, it's a really interesting uh, opportunity, I think, for the UK. Well, you know, you know, I think very similar to you, Jeremy, as far as I'm concerned, the, the edge of competition, the battlefield is right out there at that user experience. And people are globally, 8 billion people are swapping all sorts of uh, applications, et cetera. But it's that last, that last uh, quarter of an inch between the headset and the eye that really, really matters. And the ability to turn that into a, a, a user experience with the cultural element, the storytelling, the music, the sense, the haptics, the whole thing is, is where we're going to be. I can have a fantastic medical application and you can have a fantastic medical application. But if yours is a better user experience, you'll, you'll beat me. Um, final thing, uh, we've got so, so, so many uh, comments here. Uh, Chris So would like to know about thoughts on blended learning, Richard Priest about hybrid working. We could speculate, I think, in ages. But as you said earlier, it's been a you know very checkered journey so far. Um, and I'm going to kind of put you on the spot. If you had to bet, where do you think the killer app might be? It, it's really interesting. I, you know, th that is, uh, in, in some respects, it's it's the... $260 billion question. The, um, th there are really interesting areas where we're seeing potential emerging for this. So, you know, if you think about um, autonomous cars, uh, you know, the car manufacturers and designers are now thinking very, very hard about, well, what are we going to do in a car? You know, I've built my cars for years on the driver experience. There is no driver experience if someone else is driving. So what's the experience going to be? An augmented reality with its ability to be able to respond to place uh, and to dynamic geo change uh, is a really interesting opportunity. So I think that is a that is a, a very strong area. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if we also see uh, huge health applications, um, virtualized GPs. Uh, you know, we're already seeing the, the remote GP meeting happening, and and I think there's much more to come in terms of remote diagnosis and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, Look, we have Pokemon Go. I am quite sure that we will have another massive hit game that will just swamp us all and probably infuriate us all as our kids go nuts all over the planet. Uh, but uh, my guess is it's, it's actually that's probably where it will start. Oh, thank you. And as you know, I throw a chip on mind maps. So I think the, the field is open. We, we really don't know uh, where, where we're going, but it's going to be an exciting uh, journey. Um, I really have got to say thank you so much for this. Uh, lots of thanks coming in here, but that's always a sign uh, that it's time to, to wrap up. Uh, so if I may, three quick rounds of thanks. I'd like to thank the FS Club sponsors. Uh, I hope you agree with me that if this really is the future economic battleground, this metaverse is something we need to get our heads around and, and develop. Uh, secondly, if I may, I'd like to thank you, the audience. We have a, an exciting program coming up as ever. Uh, of events, and I won't, won't run through it. The, the quickest thing to do, as always, is simply uh, to go and have a quick look at the website. But on Thursday, Gavin Oldham is going to be challenging us on egalitarian capitalism, a much deeper challenge than you might think. Um, and then finally, of course, Jeremy, I have to thank you. You were so kind uh, to come, put so much work into this. And I think to inspire us, that while we may not see the roadmap very clearly, we can generally see in the fog the road is heading out that way. And I think it's going to be very, very important that we are on top of it. And I admire what you're doing in, try, in terms of trying to lead us in the UK to realize it may not be the hardware and software. It may be our traditional skills and narrative and storytelling. And for that, I thank you. On behalf of the audience, uh, I'm unable to open the floodgates. That's something else I hope we can do in future is improve concepts of digital applause. Um, but meanwhile, I have here an antique device to do it. This is my Korean karmic clapper uh, from a, a Buddhist temple. And that will have to serve, I'm afraid, until we get better headsets as our thanks to you. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Really good.